fourth pada, having approached there is manifestation, from the word own, the Zuras now proceed to consider the kind of superior existence which the released souls enjoy. The text says, Thus does that serene being, having risen from the body and having approached the highest light, manifest itself in its own form. Does this passage mean that the soul having approached the highest light assumes a new body, to be brought about then, as the body of a diva, or that it only manifests its own natural character? The text must be understood in the former sense. The pervap action holds, for otherwise the scriptural texts referring to release would declare what is of no advantage to man. We do not observe that its own nature is of any advantage to the soul. In the state of dreamless sleep the body and the sense organs cease to act, and you may say the pure soul then abides by itself. But in what way does this benefit man? Nor can it be said that mere cessation of pain constitutes the well-being of the soul which has approached the highest light, and that in this sense manifestation of its own nature may be called release, for scripture clearly teaches that the released soul enjoys an infinity of positive bliss. One hundred times the bliss of Bragapati is one bliss of Brahman and of a sage free from desires, for having tasted a flavor he experiences bliss. Nor can it be said that the true nature of the soul is consciousness of the nature of unlimited bliss which, in the samsara condition, is hidden by nescience and manifests itself only when the soul reaches Brahman. For, as explained previously, intelligence which is of the nature of light cannot be hidden, hiding in that case would be neither more nor less than destruction. Nor can that which is mere light be of the nature of bliss, for bliss is pleasure, and to be of the nature of pleasure is to be such as to agree with the self. But, if the self is mere light, Whereas the being by which light is to be apprehended as agreeable to its own nature, he, therefore, who holds the self to be mere light, can in no way prove that it is of the nature of bliss. If, moreover, that which the soul affects on approaching the highest light is merely to attain to its own true nature, we point out that that nature is something eternally accomplished and that hence the declaration that it manifests itself in its own nature would be purportless. We hence conclude that on approaching the highest light the soul connects itself with a new form only then brought about. On this view the term accomplishes itself is taken in its direct sense, and the expression in its own shape also is suitable in so far as the soul accomplishes itself in a nature specially belonging to it and characterized by absolute bliss. This view the Sutra rejects, that special condition into which the soul passes on having, on the path of the gods, approached the highest light is a manifestation of its own true nature not an origination of a new character. For this is proved, by the specification implied in the term own, in the phrase in its own nature. If the soul assumed a new body, this specification would be without meaning, for, even without that, it would be clear that the new body belongs to the soul. Against the assertion that the soul's own true nature is something eternally accomplished, and that hence a declaration of that nature accomplishing itself would be unmeaning. The next sutra declares itself, the released one, on account of the promise. What the text says about the soul accomplishing itself in its own form refers to the released soul which, freed from its connection with works and what depends thereon, the body and the rest abides in its true essential nature. That essential nature no doubt is something eternally accomplished, but as in the samsara state it is obscured by nescience in the form of Kaman, the text refers to the cessation of such obscuration as accomplishment. How is this known? From the promise, from the fact that the text promises to set forth such cessation. For Bragapati, when saying again and again, 
I will explain that further to you, does so with a view to throw light on the individual soul, first introduced in the clause that self, which is free from sin, apostrophe, in so far as freed from all connection with the three empirical conditions of waking, dreaming and dreamless sleep, and released from the body which is due to common and the cause of joy and sorrow. When, therefore, he concludes that serene being, the soul, having risen from this body and having approached the highest light accomplishes itself in its true form, comma, we understand that such accomplishment means the final release, the cessation of all bondage, which is gained by the soul, previously connected with Carmen. As soon as it approaches the highest light, the Purvapakshin had said that as in the state of deep sleep the manifestation of the true nature of the soul is seen in no way to benefit man, scripture, if declaring that release consists in a manifestation of the true nature of the soul, would clearly teach something likewise not beneficial to man and that hence the accomplishment in its own form must mean the soul's entering on such a new condition of existence as would be a cause of pleasure. The condition of a diva or the like. To this the next sutra replies, the self, on account of subject matter. The subject matter of the whole section shows that by the self manifesting itself in its own form there is meant the self as possessing the attributes of freedom from all evil and sin and so on. For the teaching of Bragapati begins as follows, the self, which is free from sin, free from old age, from death and grief, from hunger and thirst whose desires and thoughts spontaneously realize themselves and that this self which forms the subject matter of the entire section is the individual self, the manifestation of the true nature of the soul when reaching the highest light therefore means the manifestation of that self which has freedom from sin and so on for its essential attributes that nature being in the samsara state obscured through nescience. When therefore at the moment of release those essential qualities assert themselves, the case is one of manifestation of what already exists, not one of origination. Thus the reverend Sornaka says, as the luster of the gem is not created by the act of polishing, so the essential intelligence of the self is not created by the putting off of imperfections. As the well is not the cause of the production of rain water, but only serves to manifest water which already exists, for whence should that originate which is not, thus knowledge and the other attributes of the self are only manifested through the putting off of evil qualities, they are not produced, for they are eternal intelligence, therefore, bliss, and the other essential qualities of the soul which were obscured and contracted by Carmen, expand and thus manifest themselves when the bondage due to Carmen passes away and the soul approaches the highest light. On this view of manifestation there remains no difficulty. Here terminates the adhikarana of on approaching manifestation. In non-division, because that is seen, is the soul when it has reached the highest light and freed itself from all bondage, conscious of itself as separate from the highest self or as non-separate in so far as being a mere mode of that self, the form of you is the right one. For scriptural and Smriti texts alike declare that the released soul stands to the highest self in the relation of fellowship, equality, equality of attributes and all this implies consciousness of separation. Compare he attains all desires together with the all-knowing Brahman. When the seer sees the shining maker, the Lord, the person who has his source in Brahman, then, possessing perfect knowledge, and shaking off good and evil, free from all passions he reaches the highest equality, taking their stand upon this knowledge they attaining to an equality of attributes with me, are neither born at the time of a creation nor are they agitated when a pralaya takes place. Against this view the sutra declares itself in non-division. 
the released soul is conscious of itself as non-divided from the highest Brahman. For this is seen, for the soul having reached Brahman and freed itself from the investment of nescience, sees itself in its true nature. And this true nature consists herein that the souls have for their inner self the highest self while they constitute the body of that self and hence are modes of it. This is proved by all those texts which exhibit the soul and Brahman in coordination, thou art that this self is Brahman, in that all this has itself, all this in truth is Brahman, and by other texts, such as he who dwells within the self whom the self does not know, of whom the self is the body, and he who abides within, the ruler of creatures, he is thyself, the consciousness of the released soul therefore expresses itself in the following form, I am Brahman, without any division, where the texts speak of the souls becoming equal to, or having equal attributes with, Brahman, the meaning is that the nature of the individual soul, which is a mere mode of Brahman, is equal to that of Brahman, that on putting off its body it becomes equal to Brahman in purity. The text declaring that the soul attains all its desires together with Brahman intimates that the soul, together with Brahman of which it is a mode, is conscious of the attributes of Brahman. The different texts are thus in no conflict, nor on this view of the soul being non-divided from Brahman in so far as being its mode, is there any difficulty on account of what is said about the soul, here terminates the adhikarana of non-division, on account of its being seen in that of Brahman, thus Gaimani thinks, on account of suggestion and the rest dot owing to the fact that different texts give different accounts. The question now arises of what character that essential nature of the self is in which it manifests itself on reaching Brahman. Is that nature constituted by freedom from evil and sin and the rest, or by mere intelligence, or by both, there being no opposition between intelligence and those other attributes? The teacher Gaimani holds that the soul manifests itself in its Brahman character in a character constituted by freedom from sin, and so on. These latter attributes are, in the text of the small lotus, mentioned as belonging to Brahman, and may hence be referred to as the Brahman character. And that this Brahman character is the character of the released soul also follows from suggestion and the rest, for freedom from all evil and the rest are, in the teaching of Bragapati referred to as attributes of the soul. The and the rest of the sutra refers to the activities of the released soul, laughing, playing, rejoicing, and so on, which depend on the power belonging to the soul in that state to realize all its ideas and wishes. It is for these reasons that Gaimani holds that mere intelligence does not constitute the true nature of the released soul. In the soul nature of intelligence, as that is itself, thus Orjilamai thinks, intelligence alone is the true nature of the soul and hence it is in that character only that the released soul manifests itself, this is the view of the teacher or Jilamai. that intelligence only constitutes the true being of the soul, we learn from the express statement as a lump of salt has neither inside nor outside, but is altogether a mass of taste, so this self has neither inside nor outside, but is altogether a mass of knowledge, when, therefore, the text attributes to the soul freedom from evil and the rest, it does not mean to predicate of it further positive qualities, but only to exclude all the qualities depending on avidure, change, pleasure, pain, and so on, for these reasons Orjilamai holds that the released soul manifests itself as mere intelligence. Next the teacher Badarana determines the question by propounding his own view. Thus also, on account of existence of the former qualities by suggestion, Badarana holds absence of contradiction. The teacher Badarana is of opinion that even thus, 
although the text declares the soul to have mere intelligence for its essential nature, all the same the previously stated attributes, freedom from all sin, and so on, are not to be excluded. For the authority of a definite statement in the Upanishads proves them to exist, and of authorities of equal strength one cannot refute the other. Nor must you say that the case is one of essential contradiction, and that hence we necessarily must conclude that freedom from sin, and so on are the mere figments of nescience. For as there is equal authority for both sides, why should the contrary view not be held? For the principle is that where two statements rest on equal authority, that only which suffers from an intrinsic impossibility is to be interpreted in a different way, so as not to conflict with the other. But while admitting this we deny that the text which describes the self as a mass of mere knowledge implies that the nature of the self comprises nothing whatever but knowledge. But what then is the purport of that text? The meaning is clear, we reply, the text teaches that the entire self, different from all that is non-sentient, is self-illumined. Not even a small part of it depends for its illumination on something else. The fact, vouched for in this text, of the soul in its entirety being a mere mass of knowledge, in no way conflicts with the fact, vouched for by other texts, of its possessing qualities such as freedom from sin and so on, which inhere in it as the subject of those qualities not any more than the fact of the lump of salt being taste through and through, which fact is known through the sense of taste, conflicts with the fact of its possessing such other qualities as color, hardness, and so on, which are known through the eye and the other sense organs. The meaning of the entire text is as follows, just as the lump of salt has throughout one and the same taste while other sapid things such as mangoes and other fruit have different tastes in their different parts, rind and so on, so the soul is throughout of the nature of knowledge or self-illumineness. Here terminates the adhikarana of that which is like Brahman, by the mere will, scripture stating that concerning the released soul scripture states, he moves about there, laughing, playing, rejoicing be it with women, or chariots, or relatives. The doubt here arises whether the soul's meeting with relatives and the rest presupposes an effort on its part or follows, on its mere will, as things spring from the mere will of the highest person. An effort is required, for we observe in ordinary life that even such persons as kings and the like who are capable of realizing all their wishes do not accomplish the effects desired without some effort. Against this view the Sutra says by the mere will. For, in a previous passage, Scripture expressly says, He who desires the world of the fathers, by his mere will the fathers rise to receive him. And there is no other text declaring the need of effort which would oblige us to define and limit the meaning of the text last quoted, and for this very reason without another ruler. Since the released soul realizes all its wishes, it does not stand under another ruler. For to be under a ruler means to be subject to injunction and prohibition and to be such is opposed to being free in the realization of all one's wishes. Hence scripture says, he is a self-ruler. Here terminates the adhikarana of wishes, the absence, but Dari holds, for thus scripture says, a doubt arises whether the released has a body and sense organs, or not or whether he has them or not just as he pleases. The teacher Badari holds that body and sense organs are absent, since the text declares this, the text, as long as he is embodied there is no freedom from pleasure and pain, but when he is free from the body then neither pleasure nor pain touches him, declares that pleasure and pain are necessarily connected with embodiedness, and the text, Having risen from this body and reached the highest light he manifests himself in his own shape, declares that the released one is without a body, the presence, 
game and he holds, because the text declares manifoldness. The teacher game and he holds that the released one has a body and senses, because the text declares manifoldness, he is in a fold, he is threefold, he is fivefold, he is sevenfold. The self which is one and indivisible cannot be manifold, and the various forms of manifoldness of which the text speaks therefore must depend on the body. The text which speaks of the absence of a body refers to the absence of that body only which is due to Carmen, for this latter body only is the cause of pleasure and pain. Next the Reverend Badarana decides this point by the declaration of his own view. For this reason Badarana of both kinds as in the case of the twelve days sacrifice. For this reason, for the reason that the text refers to the wish of the released, the Reverend Badarana is of opinion that the released may, at his liking, be with or without a body. This satisfies both kinds of texts. The case is analogous to that of the twelve days sacrifice which, on the basis of twofold texts, those desirous of prosperity are to celebrate the Dvadasaha, and the priest is to offer the Dvadasaha for him who desires offspring, belongs, according to difference of wish, either to the Satra or the Ahina class of sacrifices. The next sutra declares that the body and the sense organs of the released are not necessarily created by the released himself, in the absence of a body as in the state of dream, that being possible, as in the absence of a body and other instruments of enjoyment created by himself, the released may undergo experiences of pleasure by means of instruments created by the highest person, the released, although capable of realizing all his wishes, may not himself be creative, as in the state of dream the individual soul has experiences depending on chariots and other implements created by the Lord, thus the released soul also may have experience of different worlds created by the Lord engaged in playful sport. When there is a body, as in the waking state, when, on the other hand, the released soul possesses a body created by its own will, then it enjoys its various delights in the same way as a waking man does. In the same way as the highest person creates out of himself, for his own delight, the world of the fathers and so on, so he sometimes creates such worlds for the enjoyment of the released souls. But sometimes, again, the souls using their own creative will power themselves create their own worlds, which however are included within the sphere of sport of the highest person. But it has been taught that the soul is of atomic size, how then can it connect itself with many bodies? To this question the next sutra replies. The entering is as in the case of a lamp, for thus scripture declares dot just as a lamp although abiding in one place only, enters through the light proceeding from it into connection with many places, so the soul also, although limited to one place, may through its light-like consciousness enter into several bodies. It may do this as well as in this life the soul, although abiding in one spot of the body only. The heart pervades the whole body by means of its consciousness and thus makes it its own. There is however the following difference between the two cases. The non-released soul has its intellectual power contracted by the influence of Carmen, and hence is incapable of that expansive pervasion without which it cannot identify itself with other bodies. The released soul, on the other hand, whose intellectual power is non-contracted is capable of extending as far as it likes, and thus to make many bodies its own. For scripture declares, that living soul is to be known as part of the hundredth part of the point of a hair divided a hundred times, and yet it is capable of infinity. The non-released soul is ruled by Carmen, the released one only by its will. This is the difference, but, a new difficulty is raised, scripture declares that when the soul reaches Brahman all its inner and outer knowledge is stopped, 
embraced by the highest self the soul knows nothing that is without, nothing that is within apostrophe. How then can it be said to know all things? To this the next sutra replies, it refers either to dreamless sleep or to union, for this is manifested. Texts as the one last quoted do not refer to the released soul, but either to deep sleep or to union, the time of dying. The latter in accordance with the text then his speech is united with his mind, heat with the highest divinity. In both those states the soul attains to the highest self and is unconscious. That in the states of deep sleep and dying the soul is unconscious and that the released soul is all-knowing, scripture reveals. The text in truth he thus does not know himself that he is I nor does he know anything that exists, he has gone to utter annihilation. I see no good in this declares that the soul is unconscious in the state of deep sleep, and a subsequent text in the same section declares the released soul to be all-knowing, he seeing these pleasures with the divine eye, the mind, rejoices. The same is clearly stated in the text, comma, he who sees this sees everything and obtains everything everywhere. That at death there is unconsciousness appears from the text. Having risen from these elements, he vanishes again in them. When he has departed there is no more knowledge apostrophe. From all this it follows that the text as to the soul being held in embrace by the Pragna self refers either to deep sleep or death. Here terminates the Adikarana of non-being. With the exception of world energy, on account of leading subject matter and of non-proximity. The doubt here presents itself whether the power of the released soul is a universal power such as belongs to the Supreme Person, extending to the creation, sustentation, and so on, of the worlds, or is limited to the intuition of the Supreme Person. The pervap action maintains the former view. For he says scripture declares that the soul reaches equality with the Supreme Person, free from stain he reaches the highest equality, and moreover scripture ascribes to the released soul the power of realizing all its thoughts. And these two conditions are not fulfilled unless the soul possess the special powers of the Lord with regard to the government of the world. To this the Sutra replies, with the exception of world energy, the released soul, freed from all that hides its true nature, possesses the power of intuitively beholding the pure Brahman, but does not possess the power of ruling and guiding the different forms of motion and rest belonging to animate and inanimate nature. How is this known? from subject matter, for it is with special reference to the highest Brahman only that the text mentions ruling and controlling power over the entire world, that from whence these beings are born, that through which they live when born, that into which they enter at death, endeavor to know that, that is Brahman. If such universal ruling and controlling power belong to the released soul as well, it would not be used as the text actually uses it, for defining Brahman, for all definition rests on special individual attributes. Analogously many other texts speak of universal ruling and controlling power with exclusive reference to the Supreme Person, being only this was in the beginning, it thought, may I be many, in the beginning this was Brahman, one only, it created the most excellent Kshitra. In the beginning all this was self, one only, it thought, let me send forth these worlds, there was Narayana alone, not Brahma, and so on. He who dwelling within the earth. This also follows from non-proximity, for in all those places which speak of world controlling power the context in no way suggests the idea of the released soul and hence there is no reason to ascribe such power to the latter. If it be said that this is not so, on account of direct teaching, we reply not so, on account of the texts declaring that which abides within the spheres of those entrusted with special functions. But, an objection is raised, 
Certain texts directly declare that the released soul also possesses world energy. Compare he becomes a self-ruler, he moves in all worlds according to his wishes apostrophe. He moves through these worlds, enjoying any food he wishes, and assuming any shape he wishes. We cannot therefore accept the restriction laid down in the last sutra. Not so, the latter half of the present sutra declares, on account of the texts declaring that which abides in the spheres of those entrusted with special functions. The meaning of the texts quoted is that the released soul participates in the enjoyments connected with the spheres of Hiranyagarbha and other beings which are entrusted with special functions. The soul whose knowledge is no longer obstructed by karma and freely enjoys all the different worlds in which the power of Brahman manifests itself and thus is fully satisfied. But if the released soul, no less than the soul implicated in the samsara, experiences enjoyments belonging to the sphere of change, it follows that the sum of its enjoyments is finite and limited and that hence the released soul is no better off than the soul in the state of bondage, of this doubt the next sutra disposes that which is not within change, for thus scripture declares the abiding that which is not within change, the highest Brahman which is free from all change and of an absolutely perfect and blessed nature, this, together with the manifestations of its glory is what forms the object of consciousness for the released soul. The worlds which are subject to change thus form objects for that soul's experience, in so far as they form part of Brahman's manifestation. For scripture declares that the released soul thus abides within, is conscious of the changeless highest Brahman, when he finds freedom from fear and an abode in that which is invisible, incorporeal undefined, unsupported, then he obtains the fearless, and that the world is contained within Brahman as its manifestation is declared in the text, in that all the worlds abide, and no one goes beyond. The meaning of the text stating that the released freely move in all worlds, and similar texts, therefore is only that the released soul while conscious of Brahman with its manifestations experiences also the enjoyments, lying within the sphere of change, which abide in the world of Hiranyagarbha and similar beings, not that it possesses the world energies, creative, ruling, and so on, which are the distinctive attribute of the highest lord. And thus perception and inference show dot that the energies connected with the rule of the entire world are exclusive attributes of the highest person, scripture and smriti alike declare. Compare scriptural texts such as from fear of him the wind blows, by the command of that imperishable one sun and moon stand, held apart, he is the lord of all, the king of all beings the protector of all beings and smriti texts such as with me as supervisor, Prakriti brings forth the universe of the movable and the immovable, and for this reason the world ever moves round, pervading this entire universe by a portion of mine I do abide. Scripture and Smriti likewise declare that of the bliss which is enjoyed by the released soul the highest person alone is the cause for he alone causes blessedness, he who serves me with unswerving devotion, surpasses these qualities and is fitted for becoming one with Brahman, for I am the abode of Brahman, of infinite immortality, of everlasting virtue, and of absolute bliss, the exalted qualities of the soul, freedom from evil and sin and so on which manifest themselves in the state of release no doubt belong to the soul's essential nature, but that the soul is of such a nature fundamentally depends on the Supreme Person, and on Him also depends the permanency of those qualities, 
they are permanent in so far as the Lord himself on whom they depend is permanent. It is in the same way that all the things which constitute the means of enjoyment and sport on the part of the Lord are permanent in so far as the Lord himself is permanent. It thus appears that the equality to the Lord which the released soul may claim does not extend to the world ruling energies and on account of the indication of the equality of enjoyment only. The previous conclusion is confirmed by the further fact that the text directly teaches the released soul to be equal to Brahman in so far only as enjoying direct insight into the true nature of Brahman. He reaches all objects of desire together with the all-knowing Brahman. The conclusion thus is that we have to shape our ideas as to the powers of the released soul in accordance with what the texts say as to the Lord only possessing the power of ruling and controlling the entire world, and that hence the latter power cannot be attributed to the soul. But if the powers of the released soul altogether depend on the Lord, it may happen that he, being independent in all his doings, May will the released soul to return into the Sorsara, of this doubt the next sutra disposes. Non-return, according to scripture, non-return, according to scripture. We know from scripture that there is a supreme person whose nature is absolute bliss and goodness, who is fundamentally antagonistic to all evil, who is the cause of the origination, sustentation, and dissolution of the world who differs in nature from all other beings, who is all-knowing, who by his mere thought and will accomplishes all his purposes, who is an ocean of kindness as it were for all who depend on him, who is all-merciful, who is immeasurably raised above all possibility of any one being equal or superior to him whose name is the highest Brahman. And with equal certainty we know from scripture that this Supreme Lord, when pleased by the faithful worship of his devotees, which worship consists in daily repeated meditation on him, assisted by the performance of all the practices prescribed for each caste and asrama, frees them from the influence of nescience, which consists of calm and accumulated in the infinite progress of time and hence hard to overcome allows them to attain to that supreme bliss which consists in the direct intuition of his own true nature, and after that does not turn them back into the miseries of samsara. The text distinctly teaching this is he who behaves thus all his life through reaches the world of Brahman and does not return. And the Lord himself declares having obtained me great soul men do not come into rebirth, the fleeting abode of misery for they have here reached the highest perfection. Up to the world of Brahma the worlds return again, O Argana, but having attained to me, O son of Kunti, there is no rebirth. As, moreover, the released soul has freed itself from the bondage of Karman, has its powers of knowledge fully developed, and has all its being in the supremely blissful intuition of the highest Brahman. It evidently cannot desire anything else nor enter on any other form of activity, and the idea of its returning into the samsara therefore is altogether excluded. Nor indeed need we fear that the Supreme Lord when once having taken to himself the devotee whom he greatly loves will turn him back into the samsara. For he himself has said, to the wise man I am very dear and dear he is to me. Noble indeed are all these, but the wise man I regard as my very self. For he, with soul devoted, seeks me only as his highest goal. At the end of many births the wise man goes to me, thinking all is Vasudeva. Such great soul men are rarely met with. The repetition of the words of the Sutra indicates the conclusion of this body of doctrine. Thus everything is settled to satisfaction. Here terminates the Adhikarana of with the exception of the world energies. Here terminates the fourth Pada of the fourth Adhyaya of the commentary on the Sarairaka Mimamsa, composed by the reverend teacher Amanuga. This completes the fourth Adhyaya, and the whole work. 
and the entire body of doctrine is thus brought to a conclusion.